everyone and welcome to this week's Wildlife Weekly Wednesday Roundup. I'm your host, Tenley Thompson, and I'm so excited to share all the great videos that we have in store for you all this week. The way this is going to work is we're going to go ahead and show you some fantastic views of really fun things we've been seeing in Grand Teton Yellowstone and the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem this week. Then there's going to be a chance to win a trivia question to our gift to our online store. And then finally, I'll be answering your questions live. So if you've got any great wildlife biology related questions, do let me know. Let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we want to show you are some great views of bull moose this week. Let's go ahead and check in. Hey, everybody. This is Mike Mann with EcoTour Adventures, and we've been out in Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park and had some amazing wildlife sightings in the last week. So I ran into a couple of bull moose this morning in full velvet and it was such a sight to see. One of the neat things is that those antlers are growing about an inch per day per point. And so here I have a moose paddle. Imagine tomorrow this being an inch larger. And one of the neat things to look for in this clip is you can actually see where the veins and arteries were supplying the blood that then grows the bone to make these tremendous moose antlers. And these can be up to six feet across. So I've got a six foot tall guy and I can't imagine what a pain in the neck that would be. Within a couple of weeks here, probably by July or so, that velvet is gonna die and then it's going to, of course, expose the bone. And just like when you get a scab, that flesh is gonna itch tremendously. So they're gonna take these antlers and thrash and bash about in the brushes and the trees and try and get these nice and polished up for the ladies. Cause you know, blood and decaying flesh is gross, right ladies? Now another couple of neat things about the moose is their fur. So I've got a piece of moose fur here and we can see that actually it's kind of white. Well, the inside of this fur is actually hollow which provides great insulation for the winter time. They can withstand temperatures of up to negative 60 degrees. So today was a great day to try and find moose because it's been raining cats and dogs, nice and cool for the moose. And one of the things that helps them, not sure if the video will show this, but there's also an under fur down here, this really light stuff, and that just helps trap heat near the body. Now a couple other things that are amazing about moose in my opinion, is moose are among the fastest swimming land mammals. They can swim up to six miles an hour, which is as fast as Michael Phelps. Although unlike Michael Phelps, who lays there panting poolside after only say a thousand meters, the moose can maintain that for two to four hours. Truly the Energizer Bunny of swimming. They also have special noses in that their nostrils are teardrop shaped. So they can close those up on command. They point down and that allows them to eat underwater. Moose have been documented diving down up to 19 feet deep to get those lily pads on the bottom of the ponds after their favorite food, the willow bush, loses its leaves in the fall. So those are some of my favorite facts about moose. And if you want to get any more, you're just going to have to come out on an eco-tour adventure and uh, hopefully we'll get to see some up close and in person. Thanks, Mike. So now I'd love to know where everybody is watching from. So go ahead and comment in the section, comment section where you're watching from. I'd love to see how far these videos are traveling, as well as tell us a little bit about your visit to Jackson Hole. Have you ever been to Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park? Do you have recommendations for other folks who might be coming to visit? We'd love to hear about that, as well as what you'd like to see during our Wildlife Weekly broadcasts. Now, Sean has some pretty amazing footage. I have to say the best footage of the week. Many months ago in the early spring, right around April, I think, he got a great opportunity to catch a mountain lion and her kittens with his trail cam. It was a once in a lifetime experience and Sean figured that was really, really cool, but I'm never gonna get that chance again. Well, it turns out when he checked his trail footage this week, he was wrong. Let's find out first about that first video he shot and then check in with these mountain lions and see how they're doing this week. I got a call from my coworker Josh that he had just found an elk calf killed by a mountain lion. So I quickly grabbed a trail camera, ran to the woods, met him. We set up two trail cameras, left for the night, came back, and we got to see this mom cat drag the elk calf, as cats like to do, under the tree to hide it. 
one kitten in the background, three off screen. She has four kittens. That mama lion's 100 pounds, the pure power to drag that elk calf with ease, 300 pounds plus. It was pretty cool. Now they fed on it for a while. That one kitten was always with the mom. The other three were a lot more camera shy, an opportunity that I may never able, uh, be able to get again. It was absolutely incredible and it's some amazing footage. So Sean thought he'd never get another chance to see those mountain lions again. And just in case he set up the trail cam to see if the lions came back. And sure enough, when he went to go check his footage this week, absolutely there they were there's the mom and the three kittens sean believes pretty strongly that these are the same lions that he saw earlier this year you can see there's a, a moose that shows up on the left hand side of the screen that they take a pretty good look at and try to pursue but really uh some great footage of mountain lions from sean this week we certainly appreciate him showing us this mom and her three kittens so thanks sean for that How cool was that? So thanks very much to Sean for that amazing footage. What I always love about mountain lions is the length of their tail. Did you see the tail at the end of that video? Mountain lions are about six feet long and have yet another six feet of tail behind them. So that big twitchy tail uh, is just amazing to see. So really, really fun footage there. Now, Eco Tour Adventures guide Laura got a really fun meeting of not one black bear, not two black bears, but three black bears this week. Let's check in with her. Hi, this is Laura. I want to tell you about a great sighting I had the other night in Grand Teton National Park. I was out with a group on a sunset trip and happened to see not one, not two, but three black bears up on a mountain called Tiwanot. Now, the first bear was pretty far away. He was probably about a thousand feet up the slope. We got a great look at him through our Maven spotting scope and binoculars. And then to our surprise, we saw you know, two other bears emerge from the woodwork. Um, the first bear that popped out, I, I think was a male bear. He was quite large, he may be about 400 pounds. Um, he was a distinctive black color with long floppy ears. And then uh, accompanying him was a second black bear. She was a little lighter in color. Instead of being the pure black, she had a little brown coloration to her, which is typical for our, our black bears here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. You know, May and June is mating season for bears. The love is in the air. <laughs> and yeah, I think the two of, the, of them were on a date that night. You know, the ma male bear was you know, chasing her around. He was in pursuit of that female. Uh, she didn't have any cubs with her, so that would make sense that she's, she's ready to mate. And perhaps next year, we'll get a chance to see some black bear cubs in the same location. <laughs> so yes, please enjoy the footage. Hope that you're enjoying our show and see you next week. Thanks. So that's pretty fun. Now, did anybody see the bird photo bombing the last about 30 seconds of that video? Does anybody know what kind of bird that was that showed up in that corner? Big, long neck, red head. It was a sandhill crane that was just casually wandering by some breeding black bears, which I'm sure that sandhill crane probably wanted to be just about anywhere but there. But it seemed to me it was kind of oblivious as to what was going on. So that's pretty darn funny. Now we got so many good videos from our guides and biologists of black bears and grizzly bears this week that I was hard pressed to choose which ones I wanted to show to you. So I decided it would be far more fun to play a game. So the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna show you some of this video footage and what I want you to do is to guess, if you want you can put it in the comment section but it's gonna be kind of quick fire so I don't know how well that's gonna work. But go ahead and guess whether what I'm showing you is a black bear or a grizzly bear. Now the way 
uh, we're going to do this is I'm going to give you a quick tutorial how to tell the difference between one versus the other because sometimes it's not actually that simple. The first thing to remember about identifying black bears versus grizzly bears is you never want to use size or color to determine which is which. When they both live in an ecosystem, like the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem of Grand Teton and Yellowstone, it can be a little hard at a distance to tell which ones you're looking at. We're very fortunate here. Grizzlies only live in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming in the continental United States, so it wouldn't come up outside of those areas. Okay, black bears have very prominent ears, a Roman flat nose, right? And then they, um, they have these sort of angular bodies with no hump and shorter nails, okay? So black bears, you're looking for prominent ears, absence of a hump, a flattened Roman nose, right? And you're not gonna use size or color. Okay, grizzly bears have a dish round face, dish shaped face. They have very hard to see ears unless they're young and a prominent hump and large claws. They also have this very angular nose. Think more like a dog's nose versus a flattened nose, okay? Everybody think they've got that in their heads? Let's see if you can differentiate between the bears we caught on video this week. This one, of course, are two youngsters in a tree. A little hard to see their faces, but the same applies. Prominent ears, flattened nose. Anybody have any guesses on what these guys are? These are black bear cubs that were caught this week. Aren't they cute wrestling up in that tree? Made me worried one of them was gonna fall out of the tree if they weren't being too careful. So once again, that Roman nose, right? Those super prominent ears, even as cubs, we can tell that those are black bears. Okay, how about this one, guys? We've got prominent ears, an absence of a hump, a Roman nose, Okay, what do folks think that is? Just saw his face, her face maybe. That was a black bear. Okay, how about this one? We've got a prominent hump and prominent ears, but this is a youngster, so sometimes ears stick out, but that hump should be a dead giveaway. Anybody have any guesses on this one? This one is a young grizzly bear. Hopefully you got that one right. Okay, how about this one? Prominent ears, Roman nose. Not really a hump, although the animal's hunched over. Never want to use size or color. Remember to differentiate between these guys. Anybody have any guesses on what we've got on this guy? Go ahead and tell me in the comments if you want to guess. This one is a black bear. A very big black bear, I might add. Pretty impressive fellow. So thanks to Seth for that footage. Okay, how about this one? Prominent hump. Very hard to see ears, nice silver back, angular nose. Any guesses on this one? That one, of course, is a classic grizzly bear. Okay, how many of them did you get right? You ready to be a guy for Ecotour yet? If you got them right, let me know in the comments section. If you want to see more of these Guess Which is Which videos, also let me know. I think it'd be fun to do a wolf versus coyote one as well. Kind of a fun little game. Let me know whether you found that enjoyable or not. Maybe we'll bring that on next week. But hopefully, A, you got to see how many bears we saw this week, which is absolutely awesome. And then B, how many different kinds of bears we saw this week. But more to the point, a little bit information about how to tell them apart. So that's pretty fun. So, okay, let's sort of change gears a little bit, get away from the predators and go to a Wildlife Wednesday favorite, which of course is the nesting hummingbirds and the nesting red-tailed hawks that our guide Mark has been following. Let's check in with him. Hi guys, quick update on the hummingbird and red-tailed hawk nest that we've been watching so far this spring. We have reached the final stages of the nesting season for these active nests. And the, uh, the reality is, is these young nestlings have grown to such an incredible size that these nests are just flat out running out of room for them. Uh, you know, all three red-tailed hawklets have full flight feathers. Uh, their heads have lost the down that they've had up until this point, And they are looking like they are getting, getting closer to taking that first flight of their lives here sometime in the next week. Uh, the, the hummingbird nest, 
Both little nestlings have grown incredibly over the last 10 days and uh, that nest is getting smaller and smaller even for those little hummingbirds. You have to remember that the size of that hummingbird nest is about the size of a quarter and both of those nestlings are running out of room uh, to turn around and to get uh, food from mom who's been busy delivering. And uh, you know, it's really been exciting watching these uh, young nestlings develop and hopefully over the next week or so, I might be able to catch uh, some of their first flights. That would be really a treat, but we'll keep an eye on it and uh, hopefully all goes well. As of right now, it's looking like we might have three hawklets fledge and both baby hummingbirds fledge, which is super exciting. All right, thanks, thanks for watching. If those baby hummingbirds get any bigger, they're not gonna fit in that nest anymore. It's been such a joy to follow these two nests throughout the summer. If you'd like to see some earlier updates, be sure to check out some of our earlier Wildlife Wednesday broadcasts. But a big, big thank you to Mark for continuing to update us on those two nests. Now guys, while that video is going on, I just realized I didn't give good credit to all of those bear videos. So I wanna give a thanks to Mike, Seth, Eric, and Verlin for all of those bear videos. After all that work, they should get a little bit of credit, don't you think? Not only did they get some great footage, but they did it with their guests and then were able to send those videos to their guests, which is a pretty awesome thing as well. Okay. So let's also check in with some of our hoofed mammals. We've been talking about carnivores. We've been talking about birds. We haven't had a good chance to check in uh, with our hoofed members. So let's kind of see what's going on with those guys. In the ungulate or hoofed mammal world, we've got a couple fun videos for you this week, starting with this really adorable moose calf that Eric filmed during a wet, rainy day this week. This little calf is growing up pretty darn quickly. Mom nearby was being very watchful, and uh, you can see he's sampling some of the local grasses, mostly still drinking milk. Eric also got a view of this bison and the cowbirds riding on his back. Cowbirds really should be called bison birds because they evolved to eat the parasites off of migrating bison. Laura also got a great view of bison and cowbirds this week. These birds provide an essential service for these bison and also provide themselves a food source. So the bison are very tolerant of them riding on their backs. We also got a view from Laura of this Western Meadowlark, the state bird of Wyoming with a bison in the background. Beth got some fun views of bison being frisky after some stormy weather, play fighting and more. So let's hear from him. So these bulls are kind of play fighting right now honing in their skills for when the rut happens a little bit later in the year, kind of August time. They'll actually fight each other, sometimes to the death, over uh, rights to breed with females. If this was serious fighting right now, you'd hear clunking heads. They'd be a lot more aggressive, so they're kind of just playing right now. So how cool was that last footage of those bison? And you notice I still got some birds in there, even though we were talking about hoofed mammals. Had to get a little western meadowlark in there. But a big thanks to Seth for that really fun footage. We're getting kind of closer to the bison breeding season, which peaks kind of right in the middle of August. But we'll start to see more and more of that rutting, breeding behavior um, as we make our way into July, which is always really fun seeing those bison bashing their heads and chasing each other around. That was all in fun, but super, super fun. Now I do want to give a big introduction to our Eco Tours naturalist, Seth, who actually is the newest member of our team. And so this is the first week he's been able to share some video. Seth is an incredibly experienced naturalist in the Yellowstone ecosystem. He's been guiding, he's been doing things for a long time, but he decided to join the Eco Tours team and I asked him for some video and boy, did he deliver this week and in a completely unfair way, he got a chance to see something that I've been trying to see my entire life in Yellowstone, which is completely unfair, and I'm really jealous, and Verlin got to see it too, 
but it really is tremendous. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the great views from Yellowstone this week and see what was so special that the two of them saw. So for starters, Josh got a great view of this hot spring in the Lower Geyser Basin this week. Um, it's kind of an unusual one. Then we also have some Harlequin ducks just below the Hayden Valley that he also got a chance to check out. They do love the rapids and the swift moving waters and streams, so that was pretty fun. In addition, Mark got a really good view of fountain paint pots, which are kind of blooping and bubbling all that acidic boiling mud. And then he also got a really cool view of the brink of the upper falls roaring over the edge into the Yellowstone River. Um, you, can, you can walk right out to the brink. It's not even a big hike to see this. One of my favorite things to show to guests. Uh, and boy, the river's still roaring. We're still not done with that snow melt yet, so pretty exciting to see. Now, Mike was lucky enough to catch an eruption of Grand Geyser in the Lower Geyser Basin. Now, this geyser only goes off every few days, and the only time I've ever seen it, I have to wait more than six hours to catch it. Uh, so it can be really hard. Uh, you've got to be in the right place at the right time, but it can reach heights of over 200 feet. So really, really cool for Mike to get a chance to see that amazing geyser with his guests. Seth got this great view of Grand Prismatic and really a cool view of a bison walking right behind yeah. Grand Prismatic, um, which is really, really cool. You can see he's just there on the boardwalk. There's Grand Prismatic, second largest hot spring in the world, and he's just walking right on behind it, which is neat. They also got these views of what look like wolf tracks and bison tracks in the thermal bacteria. Verlin and Seth also found some obsidian arrow points, which they carefully put back where they found them. A view of Great Fountain. And here's the kicker. Guys, they caught Steamboat Geyser. I'm so jealous. I've been trying to do it my whole life. It can reach heights of over 300 feet. It has intervals between 10 and 40 years. So to catch it is amazing. It is the largest quote unquote active geyser, if you call going off every 40 years active. Uh, in Yellowstone National Park, you can see how excited Verlin and Seth are to see it. Just such a highlight of their lives. And I'm so, so jealous of the whole thing. I have tried to see Steamboat Geyser so many times, but if you want to see Steamboat, which is something you may have to go your whole life to get a chance to see, now is the time. We've had 10 eruptions already this year. Actually, 10 noted eruptions, there's been two more, including this one, which haven't been recorded yet. So 12 eruptions of Steamboat already this year, which is just, this is the chance to get Steamboat. If you wanna see it, this is the year to go. When Steamboat goes off, it creates a, um, a mark on seismographs that's more severe than earthquakes. That can be seen for state from states all around. It chucks giant rocks out of it when it's going. It has this monster steam phase and you can't hear anybody talk while it's going off. It's one of the most amazing geysers in the world. And man, I'm gonna see it one of these days. I'm gonna see it and I'm gonna get video and I'm gonna show you guys. But in the meantime, a big thank you to Seth and Verlin who immediately had to tell me when they saw it before. They even got a chance to clean their cars when they got back to the garage. They had to tell me all about the fact that they'd seen it. So a big appreciative thank you for catching that on video uh, and getting that once in a lifetime opportunity. Pretty fun times in Yellowstone. It is the peak of the Yellowstone season. It's just a fun time up there. Lots and lots going on. So as a reminder, of course, it's really important to us, if you're willing, that you go ahead and like and share this video. Tell us where you're watching from. We really wanna try to make these videos bigger, to improve them, and the best way to do that is to get more viewers. And we so appreciate the folks that are sharing these videos every week, the folks that are coming back in to tune in. I am so flattered by all of that, so thank you very much for that. And uh, if you're willing, a like and a share would sure make a big difference to us. Okay, let's keep going. We've got plenty more to show you. We're gonna check in with Sean and a little beaver friend that he found. This chunky fellow looks like he's having a good old time. He's scratching himself and you can see him rub his paw at the base of that tail. And what he's doing is he's going to his castor gland, which beavers have, that excrete an oil which helps waterproof their fur. Now the interesting thing about a castor gland is it used to be used a lot in vanilla flavoring, perfumes, and other food ingredients. Now it's not as commonly used, but you can still find it in some perfumes out there. 
But for now, this guy's just using that caster gland to waterproof his fur. Had himself a good scratch. Looks like he's having a good time. He's going to slip off into that water. Nice and waterproofed and hopefully get himself a nice meal of some willow. So he's pretty cute. Little plump beaver there. If you've ever wondered where castor oil comes from, now you know. You know? Uh, in fact, modern day castor oil, like, you know, castor oil that you'd put in your car or other things. There's a synthetic castor oil now. People aren't going around killing beavers for their um, their glands anymore. But there is castor oil, like Sean was saying, still in some perfumes and some other things. You'll see it around. But those old stories I read growing up of having to eat castor oil when you had a cold or whatever, I'm not sure the oil glands of a beaver are going to do much to help you with a cold. Uh, probably why we don't do that anymore, but kind of a fun view from Sean. So thanks very much for that. Now, I didn't want to uh, neglect the flora part of things. We have lots of fauna to talk about, but I wanted to talk about two of the most important plants in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, as well as check out some of the wildflowers that we've been seeing. So let's tune in with that. So here we are on Spring Gulch with a typical uh, field of sage, and this sage has a beautiful smell, a fragrant aroma. It's about two, three feet tall, but it doesn't have that crazy magnificence that we see with the big sage. It's a much, much smaller plant. So this typical sagebrush that we see, oftentimes called low sagebrush, is an incredibly important resource for wildlife. There's some studies that suggest that 100% of sage grouse diet 75% of pronghorn antelope diet and over 50% of diets of deer and elk are sagebrush in the winter months. So it's definitely important. Sage is also an incredibly important ecosystem. It hides an extraordinary number of ground dwelling animals and it helps wildlife to hide from predators. It can range in height from about two feet tall to the 13 feet tall that we can see in big sage. It can be really hard to put in perspective how big, big sage really is. I stand about five feet, eight inches tall, and this sagebrush behind me is probably six to seven feet tall. And it's about as thick at the base as my arm. It's a tremendously huge plant and it's lived here for a very long time. Now the hillsides of Spring Gulch are actually covered in big sage, these gigantic, beautiful specimens. And so if you ever get the opportunity to get up on Spring Gulch, you can see these pretty close. There's a couple patches out on the National Elk Refuge and a few other areas in the valley, but it's actually a really, really rare plant. Big sage doesn't just grow very tall. I've also heard stories of root systems nearing 40 feet in depth with a deep taproot that brings moisture to the surface of the soil in the evenings that allows other plants to survive. Nearly a hundred bird species depend on sagebrush ecosystems. There's also lots of inter interactions with wildlife. Sharp-tailed grouse, pygmy rabbits, sage thrashers, sage sparrows, and brewer sparrows in particular have a lot of interdependent needs with sagebrush. This week, I even saw the beginnings of flowers and pollination occurring in sagebrush. These rosy pink little fluff balls are actually a sagebrush flower. So the next time that you see sagebrush on the side of the road, I hope that you give it a renewed appreciation and also have great respect for the big sagebrush that is such the important cornerstone of our local habitats. Now, a lot of people over the years have asked me, how do I identify big sage versus typical sage? And it's not difficult. It's huge by comparison. It's hard to quantify how much bigger. There's really going to be no doubt when you see it. Now, there are a lot of other fun things going on in the plant world this week as well. Lodgepole pine trees, another foundation of our ecosystem, are starting to put out pollen. And one of my favorite things to do as a kid and an adult is to shake these guys and see the pollen fly everywhere. My husband doesn't like it as much, a little bit allergic to that tree pollen. But for those of you guys who are not, it's well worth your time to give them a little shake and see that pollen fly. It's a lot of fun. Lots of wildflowers continue to be out, including sticky geranium, antelope bitterbrush, a really important food source for hoofed animals, common yarrow, one of my favorites, 
and blue penstemon, which is a one I don't typically see every day and was an exciting find for me, as well as purple aster, which is always a way to brighten up any day. So some plant stuff for you guys. For all of these that are worried about like the sanctity of my nose and my sinuses after shaking lunch pole pine pollen, I'm totally fine. Uh, my husband was nearby when I was doing that. He was not very happy with me. Uh, definitely super allergic. So if you're not allergic, go try to shake those lodgepole pine. It's really, really fun if you are allergic. Maybe stay away from your friends who choose to shake lodgepole pine. Might be a good choice. So, okay guys, a reminder of how the rest of this is gonna go. I've got a couple quick things to talk about that are gonna be really fun. And then we're going to uh, have a trivia question of the week where we're gonna answer last week's trivia question, give you another chance to win a gift card to our Eco Tour store. And then of course, I'll be here to answer your questions live about the natural world. So if you've got a question that you're wondering about, maybe about something we've seen on video today, go ahead and start asking those in the comment section and I will definitely get to those. We've got kind of a fun blog this week and I wanted to talk to you guys about that because it's about $3.99. There's been a lot of folks wanting an update on $3.99. We did see her this week. She and the quadruplets are doing just fine. She was too quick to get a good video of her, but she's doing okay. We also saw her 12 year old daughter, 610 and her cubs, they're doing fine as well as Blondie and her cub who are doing fine. But people wanted to know a little bit more about $3.99. If you'd like to do that, check out our blog post on our blog. We've got some great first-hand accounts. Some of our um, ecotour naturalists and biologists have a lot of experience with her. I personally have been watching her since 2007. Uh, and ecotour biologist Verlin actually has um, some great experience with her with the interagency grizzly study team where he used to work. So check out that blog post to find out more from her. Thanks very much to Josh for doing all the research on that. Should be uh, a lot of fun. I already read it. I'm pretty excited about what he has to say. Hopefully we'll have more footage of her next week for you guys uh, if she wants to come out and uh, show us a little bit more skin than that brief view that we got. Wasn't like we didn't see bears this week, as you already saw, since it was half of our roundup this week was bears. Just not that bear, I guess. Now, I do, of course, want to make sure everybody gets a chance to answer last week's trivia question. So let's start with last week's question. So you can answer this in the comments if you want, but it's not going to get you the gift card. And the question was, of course, what is this animal? This video comes to us from Verlin, who we were just talking about. It's a little tricky because it's swimming, right? But that big tail should be a dead giveaway. Question is, what species is this? Now, some people complained to me that this was too easy. And I needed to do a better job asking you guys something harder. And so I think I've got one that'll stump you a little bit. But in the meantime, if you know, you can go ahead and comment if you want. What species is this? Any guesses? Of course, our answer of last week's trivia question is, that is a fox, a red fox swimming across the river there. We have both red foxes and cross foxes here. And a kind of funny, kind of interesting thing, uh, when we reintroduced wolves to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, fox populations rebounded and recovered because of that, which is a little counterintuitive, right? Well, it's not if you think about it. Coyotes kill a lot of foxes for stealing from them and taking from carcasses. And wolves kill a lot of coyotes from stealing from them and taking from their carcasses. And so when wolves were preying more on coyotes, coyotes were preying less on foxes. And wolves don't really see foxes as worth a notice. They're beneath their notice. And as a result, fox populations are recovering throughout the greater Yellowstone ecosystem as a result of the return of the gray wolf to the system. So kind of a strange little side note there, a little unexpected side effect of bringing the biodiversity and all of the species that belong to the region back to the region. So kind of fun. Okay, this week's trivia question. Everybody ready? You're answering the question, what kind of animal is this? I need the species, please. And this might be a little tricky. We got this week's trivia question comes to us from Sean, who got such a great view of this little guy. The long tail should be dead giveaway, as is sort of that buffy body and that dark top. 
So go ahead and comment in the comment section what species this is. And one of you will uh, win a $10 gift card to our Eco Tours store. So if you know the answer, go ahead and tell us what species that is. There's a good chance to win. We're so excited that last week's winner ended up actually coming out on a trip. So that's going to be really fun. We look forward to that. Um, and we've had some really fun stuff added to the store in the last two weeks. I'm really excited about some of the new artwork, particularly Chelsea's gunpowder artwork and some new Mangelson, Thomas Mangelson, very famous wildlife photographer prints. Check that out as well as logo wear, everything else at our Eco Tours uh, online store. We started that as a way to help pay for employee health insurance during the COVID closure. 100% of the proceeds of that store are continuing to go towards that really good cause. So if you'd like to support us on our health insurance during this pandemic, we sure appreciate it. If you uh, take a quick look, see if there's something that appeals to you in that store, grab one of my mugs, grab a plate, grab some gunpowder artwork. It's pretty cool stuff that we've got in there, so check that out. Okay, so that's what we have for you guys this week. I'm here to answer your questions live. I've already seen a couple questions already uh, that have been coming through. Bear with me, I'm gonna grab their screen here and I'm gonna see uh, what people have asked and I'll answer them one by one. So hang on one second here while I look through. Ooh, lots of good answers to the trivia question. Well done, guys. Susan asks, what is the current population of mountain lions in the parks? Susan, by parks, I assume you mean Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. Uh, you ask a really, really good question. And I'm going to give you the short answer and the long answer. The short answer, we don't exactly know. The long answer is these mountain lions are the most studied mountain lion population in the world. And we still don't quite know. <laughs> mountain lions are very secretive. We are beginning to understand how much the carrying capacity of an ecosystem can hold in terms of mountain lions. How many males versus females, how big their territories are, for instance. These are not things that we necessarily have historically known because of the research that we've been doing uh, in this region. We do know that we've got um, around, uh, I think it was in the 40s, in the Grovant drainage, just outside Grand Teton National Park. Um, if you extrapolate that as really good elk habitat, that would be on the high end of a number of animals in a range. Uh, and so while I can't give you an exact answer, it would be in the hundreds, not in the thousands per se. So hopefully that answers that for you. Really good. Let's see what else we've got. Thanks, Chris. I'm a little hyper today. I think I had a little bit too much coffee, but I'm having a lot of fun. She says she loves my energy. I'm flattered. Let's see here. A lot of comments about Steamboat. Boy, I am so excited about that. Somebody commenting about a trip they took with Mike. I'm so glad, Ginger. We'll certainly let Mike know. Ooh, lots of good answers on the trivia question, but guys, I asked exactly what kind of animal it is. So you can't tell me what family it's in. I almost gave it away. <laughs> you can't tell me what family. I need to know the actual species name. Now, we were talking about this, I think it was last week, uh, which should give you a hint. Uh, I'll go ahead and I'll tell you it's a kind of weasel. It's in the weasel family. But what kind of weasel is it? Anybody have any guesses? Go ahead and comment in the comment section. I don't know if we have a right answer yet. Maybe I asked one that was too hard this week. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know, what is the cat's name meowing in the background? Awesome to have her participate. This is like the third week that she's chosen to do that. Uh, she briefly actually jumped up on the couch behind me uh, during the video. So you didn't get a chance to see her and now she's scampered away. Uh, she was quietly sleeping all day till I decided to film this. And then of course she had to run around and meow and make a fuss. That is Orca, 
uh, Orca, the domestic black and white cat. She's, um, she's black and white. She loves water and killing things. So we call her Orca as a result of that. And uh, yes, that was the meowing that you're hearing. I, I do have a pet cat who's decided that she wants to join in. So I'm glad you all have been enjoying that. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Kobe. That's very funny that you heard her. Let's see. Hmm, any more questions? I'll give you guys a couple more seconds. And then if I don't see one, you can always ask a question in the comment section throughout the week. I'll continue to monitor that comment section, get you guys some answers. Um, you can always continue to answer the trivia question. We'll accept, um, if you already answered weasel, and I'm not accepting that, you can go ahead and give us another one if you wanna be more specific. Remember that buffy underlayer and that dark back and the long tail. This is as close to giving it away as I can. Uh, in the comment section for your gift card. In the meantime, I think, let's see. I think those are all the questions we have this week. So guys, it's been a pleasure hanging out with you. Thank you so much for joining us this Wednesday. Remember to share this video if you find it fun so we can get a bigger audience, we can improve it. If you've got something you'd like for us to feature next week, please do tell us. Folks have been asking, they're enjoying Mark with his nesting birds. And of course they always want grizzlies and bears and wolves and the like, but something specific, you want a prothomatory warbler or a tiger salamander or something. We are here to please. Let me know. We'll certainly get that for you. Big thanks to all of our guides who contributed video this week. They're all out there working hard, taking folks out on trips and getting some great views. I hope you guys have a wonderful week and have had a wild Wednesday and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.